Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today uh, about digitizing student records called scanning up. Oh, and there's my dog right on cue. Jake, why don't you take the lead here for a second? OK, so um, yeah, so as Will was saying, welcome to the webinar. It looks like we've got quite a few filtering in, so that's great. Um, I, we'll get started here in just a few minutes. We'll make sure we're not having any technical difficulties. So we'll uh, have you like raise your hand or, or do a little chat or something just so we can make sure you can hear us so we're not talking to ourselves. So if, if you see that little hand button, um, could you raise your hand so that we can see and make sure that uh, we're being heard? Okay, good. Seeing some hands. Great. So everyone can hear us. That's good. Um, Will, when you're Yeah, ready, I can take over again. Hey, sorry yeah, about that, sorry. everyone. It's just uh, right on cue. The delivery person dropped something off and my new dog went nuts. So, okay, we saw people raise hands so they can hear us. Uh, raise your hand if you can see the screen. You should be seeing the screen that says nuts and bolts on it. All right, I see a couple hands going up, so we are all set. Everything is working smoothly. Uh, just as a heads up, you are muted and you're not on video, but use the Q&A tool uh, to put any questions or comments in. Um, we may not see them as we go along. If we do, we'll try to answer them along the way, but if we don't, we will have a portion at the end where we, are, we will answer your questions. And just to jump back to what I was going to say when we first started, my name is Will Whitney. I'm the EVP of Sale and Head of Sales and Marketing. And for this webinar, I have Jake Walker here, who is our expert, our su subject matter expert for digitizing student records. So it's a little bit of a tag team here, but that's who we are. And just so you have a little background on what we're doing here. So the purpose of this particular webinar is to for you to understand the scope, pricing, and process of a digital conversion project for student records. The scope and pricing, you can get that from every, anyone. The process is a little bit specific to us. We can't speak to what other companies do or how they do it, but we're just going to describe our process so you have an idea that if you decide to work with us, um, this is what you'll go through. And most likely you'll be working with Jake because he works with probably 90% plus of our um, education clients. Second is to determine if digitizing is right for you. It's not right for everyone, but we hope it is right for you. And then if you think it is, get you started with a brief consultation. That is one of our end goals is that if you're watching this, you think not that you necessarily have to work with us, but if you think I do want to digitize, I'm considering it. We're happy to help you get some ideas and solutions and give you options as you move forward down the path of digital conversion. So, and I also have a um, throat lozenge, of course, right on cue. I woke up this morning with a little cold, sore throat and whatnot. So perfect timing for a webinar. But Let's first get into what are the records we're going to digitize or you're going to digitize. The three key records we see in this arena are microfilm, which looks just like that, at least an example. Microfiche, and this is just a fake record. We're not showing any real student records. These are all ones that Jake actually had our team kind of make up for um, uh, a sample set we have in one of our platforms. So film, fiche. And then paper records. This is just, you know, binders or whatnot. You might have single page transcripts, different types of files, but paper, film, and fiche are what we see almost every time. There are a couple other little things you might want to do in the conversion world, but this is going to be the bulk of what we're talking about. Jake, anything on this before I move on? No, just uh, abstract cards would be worth mentioning, but. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't have a picture of that because I did not. Um, again, this is why Jake's here. If you've seen abstract cards in the student record world, that's uh, that's something you may have as well. Those are those uh, about three by seven kind of card stock materials. Those are after cards. So the scope, so scope pricing process for scope. The, the main points of what we're looking at here are one, the scanning itself. So what Jake's going to do is find out what do you what are you scanning? What are you looking to have converted to digital? And that's the, one of the major determinants of that, which will also be part of pricing is what type and how many records. So that's going to be the scanning. Then you have indexing, which at a high level, like this is a microfilm role. You might be doing role level indexing, which is capturing the information from that role label. Microfiche title indexing. You're not going to the individual pages, just the, getting the strip there. You might have paper records where you are getting, of course, the page level or file level, or what you find on the microfilm and microfiche are these types of records that were just photographed to microfilm, but you do want those indexed uh, at that level. 
And then there's the digital delivery. So Jake, for scoping, what do you typically find is the uh, most important step when you've worked with your clients or what's the most pertinent step as you kind of get into the, the, the beginning of a project? Yeah, so obviously identifying what you have is important. You know, we have rolls of microfilm or we have sheets of microfiche. Um, just so we kind of know what we're talking about here, because there's a different price point for all those different types of mediums. You know, paper transcripts are going to be a different price than scanning records for microfilm and microfiche. It's a whole different process. So identifying what you have is very important. And then quantity. So how much of it do you have? Rolls of film is really easy to count up. We, we kind of expect you to be able to do that. Microfiche, aperture cards, even transcripts, that's a little bit more difficult to quantify you know, how many sheets of microfiche do we have? How many transcripts do we have? So a lot of times we'll just say, you know, give us an estimate or provide us with some photos so that we can kind of, because I've seen so many of these that usually I can see a photo, you know, and I could see it in a drawer or in a filing cabinet and I can ballpark roughly how many that's going to be. This will at least get you close so that we can identify the, the range of cost. So you can see, okay, is this going to work in this fiscal year? Is it going to be multiple? Do we need to go and get multiple quotes because the cost is going to be too high, those kinds of things. So volume, types of material, that's really the most important. And then lastly, what do you want to do with it? Where do you want it to go? Uh, how do you want it indexed? Is it going into a current system? Is it going into a new system? Is it just going on a hard drive? Um, those are the biggest factors to identify when we figure out, okay, what's the scope? What's the cost? Yeah, and from my limited exposure in the student record or education area, but just project projects in general, when someone says a scanning project or conversion project, of course you're thinking, well, it's a scanning project. That's going to be the most important part. What we typically find, at least in microfilm, microfiche, it's not usually, I mean, yes, you have to do it. That's the real meat of what you want to do. You want to get these converted. But the, the heavy stuff comes in indexing typically, and this is where we'll get into it in the next section and um, maybe pricing a little bit. But Going from that role level, let's say you have 2,000 roles of student records. Going from role level to saying, I want individual pages captured, that's not a scanning issue. That's a, an indexing portion that can just sometimes balloon a project depending on how many images, how detailed it is. Same idea for the um, microfiche. If you're capturing a title strip, it's very easy for us or a company like us to say, this physical microfiche sheet is a unit. I'm capturing the top of this unit and indexing it compared to what you might find is up to 60 or so images on this individual microfiche sheet. I'll go back to this image here. If we have to find individual students on that sheet, it can become complicated depending on the, the, well, the complexity of the individual images. Are they consistent? Are they form types? Which uh, Jake's has some experience with. Do we, we basically have to look at every single page in most instances. So you can see how that can start blossoming with costs to get you a maybe a three page file instead of your uh, fiche level, which you're used to now. So something uh, I believe Jake does, what I do as well. We typically like to tell folks, let's start with the scope. Let's start with, well, how do you do it now? You're using the physical records in some fashion. Let's at least replicate that to start and see where we are in pricing. And then if you think I really need to go a little further, that's you can get more granular, get a little more fancy, uh, depending on what you need. But the indexing is really, that, that can be one of the most, um, one of the largest costs of a project. Any comments, Jake, or move on? No, I think that's good. Okay. So pricing, I'll just give you some high level pricing for film, fiche and paper records. Uh, before showing a couple pictures of where this may deviate. But for microfilm, most projects that we, you know, we're not counting the small project where you may have three rolls of film or uh, 20 rolls or 50 rolls or fees. You may have just a couple thousand fees. I mean, these are not insignificant projects themselves, but just the quantity is on the smaller size side. You may have five, 10, 15, 20 boxes of paper. Those are what we consider smaller projects. The general pricing for what I'm describing is you're in the couple hundred to multi-thousand rolls of film, you're going to be somewhere around $20 to $40 per roll. It'll depend on the quantity, and then a lot will depend on the indexing. And then a couple other things we'll show in a second. For fiche, you're generally looking around a dollar to a dollar 10, 15 cents-ish. 
Again, there's, a, there's always a specific, every project has its nuances, but that's a good range to start about a buck per physical sheet, not image, the actual sheet. And then paper, 175-ish to 250 a box, very high ranges. And that's where, when you're in the, you know, 100 plus box area, that's just a good place to start. It's not the, the end all firm price, but if you're thinking, geez, I got 500 boxes. Okay, you're probably going to be, Based on units, how many how many units you have for your project? Because you have five hundred, probably towards the lower end of that. Until we get into the specifics of indexing, how clean the records are, how many files there are, things of that sort. Same idea for film and fiche. So twenty to forty dollars a roll, around a dollar per fiche, and then call it around two hundred ish dollars per box of paper. Now for uh, film, there are a couple nuances. So we're thinking a hundred foot rolls of film. Simplex images, which is basically one image per, just like image, 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 image. There's the things we'll show that are different than that. And um, yeah, basically 100 foot simplex rolls are what we typically see, but Jake's had some fun projects with other types that show up. So this is the 100 foot simplex, just image, 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 image. Now, if it's 215 feet long microfilm, you can imagine there's up to well, at least twice as many images going from 100 to 215 feet. That can change the price because we have to scan more film, scan more images and process more. And then there are some, um, some projects like this. Um, I forget the actual one, but Jake, there was one where we were understood it and were, uh, it was described as all 100 foot simplex. His client had about a thousand rolls and maybe half of them or something of that sort were 215 duplex. So not only is the film twice as long, so there's already twice as many images, but it's a smaller reduction ratio. The images are captured at a smaller size and they're duplex. See, two images, two images, two images. So those rolls had, I think, like 15 to 20,000 images on them compared to a normal roll 100 foot simplex that has about 2,500 images. So do you want to describe any of that, Jake, and kind of what, what went on with that project or anything specific about it? Yeah, yeah. So I guess backing up just a little bit, you know, we don't expect you guys to know the answer to all of this. Um, however, it, it is a good uh, good thing to do to kind of inform yourselves of what you have by taking a look at some of the roles. Um, you know, knowing for us, knowing ahead of time if it's simplex or duplex is a big deal because as you can see, it's almost double the number of images, especially if we're going to index. If we're going to index, you're looking at, you know, if we're going to give you a cost per roll to index. It's going to be double that if it's a duplex because there's double the number of records. So that's important for us to know. You're not really going to know whether it's a 100 or a 200 foot mm -hmm. roll of microfilm um, unless it says it on the box or if you're familiar with the different types of microfilm. Um, quickly, or if you watch if you watch our videos or read the blog that describes how to figure yeah. out, it's kind of tricky, but there is a way to do it. Even yeah, te technically, it. anything and everything we're going to talk about today, or you'd ever want to know, is on our website. Uh, but yeah, so we don't expect you to know that, but it is something to be aware of. I don't see it in every project, but as Will mentioned, we did see it in a large project we did with a big university down in Los Angeles, where they thought they had all 100 foot rolls, and so we based the pricing on that. But then it turns out we found a bunch of these 215 foot duplex rolls, which are quadruple what we thought. So we didn't just scan it and then send them a bill for double the cost. We, we, we told them about it. We said, hey, this is how many we found. This is what the cost would be. What do you want us to do? Um, and so they did some research on their end and they came up with additional funding and had to scan it um, at that there, higher cost. There was a, um, because it, like as Jake mentioned, even... I think you went down or you may have gotten a couple samples before the project, but these particular rules weren't included in the sample. So it's very hard, especially when you get to a couple hundred, couple thousand rolls, you're not going to know what's on every single one of them. And we did come to a, a kind of an arrangement where it wasn't like, hey, you should have known. Here's the price for this. You owe it. We came to an arrangement. We met in the middle. And Jake's best selling of his year that year was selling to the management team to come to an agreement there. So good job, Jake. Yeah. Now for, uh, so it is important to know samples help a lot, which is something that we talk about a lot with customers is if we can get a sample, a representative sample of different years, different types of records, that shows us, shows us a lot. And we can really firm up a pricing scope for you as we move, move along in the you know, proposal stages. Let's see. Now, Fish, we mentioned the, you know, around a dollar, let's say, 
that's typically for um, title strip, uh, title level indexing, where we're just capturing what's on that top, on the top part here. But if you decide to go into the image level, say it's you know, every three, four, five or so pages of a new student, lots of these are not very consistent in student records. I mean, there may be forms transcript or uh, some projects that Jake's done that you will have a lot of consistencies and you can typically in the paper side, but film and fiche, it's, I've done my own project where I'm, I'm looking through roles and it's just so hard to tell when you find a student, you basically have to look at every image. So you do start getting higher level pricing when you get to the, I want file level or page level indexing to capture the student. Again, we go back to, do you really need that? Or can you just keep it as it is now, which is how you're using it. You've been, you have been using it for years or decades and it's worked fine, but now it's in digital. So it's inherently uh, faster and more effective. And then these images could be paper. They could be from film or fish as well. But Jake, if you want to um, mention kind of what your clients typically are capturing from these and the difficulties that can come with that when you get to indexing. Yeah, so it's it's fairly uh, normalized as far as what everybody wants. I mean, everybody obviously wants your student name, um, typically date of birth, uh, social ID if it's present, um, and maybe some other information. We've had some where they want the degree, they want uh, graduated, ungraduated. Um, I've even had some where they've wanted the address of the student. Um, so really, it's going to be dependent on what your needs are, but you also want to kind of filter those needs based on cost, because each additional field could be an additional cost, depending on how difficult it is for us to locate those fields and how consistent they are. So keep that in mind. Ideally, I, I tend to uh, steer my customers towards just keeping it simple and just doing mm -hmm. what you need. Not, not, I mean, you can put together, it's like buying a home, you have a big wish list of all the items you want, and then you get that cost and you're like, well, we need to, you know, maybe whittle down some of those uh, wants into what we need. So obviously name, date of birth, social, those are the big ones. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll need your help uh, assisting us to kind of find, you know, where these things are located. Um, we, we, so we'll work with that. We like to do that milestone sample at the beginning of projects. And hopefully we have a good representation of the overall projects. We have some really old transcripts, some stuff in the middle, some newer stuff, just so that we can get a good idea as to how the transcripts change over time because transcripts do change over time. Usually there, we see five, six, seven different formats. And then incoming transcripts, that's a whole nother ball game because of course they're coming from all kinds of different universities and colleges. So those can be all over the place. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of different factors there as far as how, how pricing goes and how indexing goes. But typically what we're doing is mostly just the, uh, the normal transcripts from that university or college, not necessarily in the, uh, the incoming stuff. So it's usually fairly, uh, you know, they're, they're following the same style of formatting. So it's easier for us to capture that data. And something with uh, just looking at some of these, some of the indexing, like uh, let's say we're looking at this page, you see, yes, name, student name, issue to student name. If for some reason, let's say my name's on there, Will, it's, a, you know, this one says Will Whitney, but then this one says William D. Whitney, which one do we capture? Like that's, that's just one example of a small nuance that you might, or we might find that as you go along records. And that's something where from the perspective, we're not the registrar, we're not the ones that handle these. I mean, no kind of inherently you think, well, it's the same person that goes with this file. The way we do these projects is to get it to a scalable and efficient productive level. So we have to put rules in place. So our folks know that they're capturing a certain, a certain field or a certain record so little things like that are important. Now, exceptions will pop up. There's always, there are always exceptions in projects. They're never perfect. But what we try to do is reduce the number of exceptions and plan for the bulk and say, yes, we'll figure out the exceptions or at the end. Or it might be, well, if you see two names, you're going to, uh, the primary, if there are two names here on this particular document, capture the one that says issued to or something like that. All these little things will come into projects that go into the a more detailed scope um, that we would work out with you. Just, just a small example. All right, I'll run through um, our process of how we uh, do projects. So let's assume we have a contract in place. Of course, we have a contract. There might be a PO in place, whatever it is, but we got to get the contract in place before we start the project. So that's done. Let's assume it's signed. Excellent. Jake just mentioned the M1. So that is what we call our milestone one proof of concept process. And basically, 
So again, the contract's done, we have a scope of work. Let's say we've done some samples early on, but we have the idea of what we wanna do. Even if we've done a sample, the M1 is when our project manager, uh, she's actually, we call her the M1 architect. And what she'll do is she takes all the new projects and sets up the entire process flow from beginning to end. It might be 10 steps if it's really simple. It might be 50 step steps if it's very complex. This is an actual microfilm scanning project workflow that we changed the name just so it doesn't show you who it actually is. That's just a made up name. But this one was eh, 25 steps. It wasn't too complex, but you know, see, see there are a few step um, parts to it. So we set that up. And then we take those, mic let's say it's a microfilm project, a thousand rolls, and there are three or four different types of records. We'll take a small batch of film that represents each of those, run them through the entire process flow to make sure A, our process works. B, at the end of it, it delivers what we believe based on the contract and the scope of work you should be getting. And it, three, from our side, it shows us, did anything come up that was weird? Happens a lot. Something shows up, we go, whoa, this was not talked about. Hey, Jake, you need to talk to your client because this is not even part of the scope of work. This is something we found during the M1. We need to figure out. So it allows us to do that. But best for you is we get to the end and you will get to review the M1. And before we move forward with the rest of the project, we require an approval from our clients for every project before we move forward with the rest of the project. We don't want to get to the end of scanning 2000 rules. Say, here you go. And you tell us, that's not what I want. Nobody wants that. It's happened. 20 years ago, happened the time, we said no more of this. We created the M1 process, it's reduced that. There's always gonna be something that comes up, new things that pop up during large projects, but it at least allows us to uh, initially find, is it gonna work? Is there, anything, is there anything weird about it? And then you get that approval process. So you get the warm and fuzzy that we're doing the right thing, you're gonna get the right result before you move forward to the big, the, the larger part of the scanning project. Now, Typically, we will get the M1 before the main project. The M1 takes around three to four weeks because it depends on our capacity, how many new projects we have in-house in that we're working on. But just to get it set up, run the process, it might be the, you know, scanning a couple boxes of paper, some fish, some film. It takes about typically around three weeks to get that done and ready for approval. But once that's approved, we would have transportation logistics in place. Um, there are a couple different methods, variations on how it will work but then we'll start getting your records to us to do the main part of the project based on that M1. And then of course the scanning, as we mentioned, if this is all set up, the material is the same as the M1 records. It's all kind of similar. It's consistent. The scanning is a simple part because it's already set up. Now just get the record, get them ready for scanning and get them through the process. Then it comes to post-scan processing, which includes maybe tightening up some image, doing images, doing some framing, uh, cropping of images, maybe from the film or fiche. It can include OCR. This does include the indexing portion. And then, of course, when we get to the end, there's a digital file delivery. And just going back to this image real quick, the green means, I'm looking at this, this is about, a, that's an 800 at the top. So there's maybe 795 roles that are in the phase to configure role XML. But during the entire project, this is not just for the M1, we track every single unit that you send us in this process flow. So the assigned project manager after the M1 will know that, great, these 800 rolls are moving along, they're fine. These couple hundred are great. These ones are done. Okay, this thing in purple or red, you know, there's a flagged exception for something. I need to go look at that, see why those 20, 30, 40 rolls, whatever it is, one roll, why it's stopped in this process is an issue, we need to fix it. So we're tracking your project the entire time we know exactly where they are uh, in the process. So digital file delivery, you get the, uh, your records some method. Um, it might be on a hard drive, a US, uh, an FTP, or maybe in a platform. And then, of course, the return of your materials. Now, part of that, occasionally clients do want to dispose of their material. Depends on the client, but that is an option. And then lastly, uh, one of the methods of, of delivery, even if we do all the other steps, which we would do, you may go into the next step of digital reel, which we'll talk about. Uh, a little bit after this, but Jake, are there any spots on here that you'd like to uh, add any uh, commentary? Yeah, so I guess one thing to point out is, that we mentioned a little bit earlier is that we have a lot of information on our website, a lot of blogs, a lot of articles that we've written, and it's, you can find it very easily on our website. And we've 
we go into a lot more detail on pretty much every item on this list. Um, so in addition, obviously, to talking to myself or Will to get more information, um, we've got a wealth of knowledge on the website to, to give you more detail. But one thing about transportation logistics, this probably comes up the most. Um, we, If you haven't figured out by now, we are out of California. And so we do our scanning work for the most part out of California. So sometimes logistics, um, there is some logistics in transportation. So we, I've, I've worked with very large universities, um, very small colleges. I mean, you name it, everything in between all across the country, um, all the way up in Maine, Florida, Texas, uh, Michigan, all, all of the above. Um, so I've pretty much done every uh, different variable of logistics and transportation that's, that's out there. So again, we have a lot more detailed information on our website, so I don't want to go into it too much, but there is a solution to all of those uh, obstacles that may arise with getting the material to our production facility here in California and making sure it's secure and that it's orderly and, you know, while the tracking and everything's in there. Um, so yeah, so, so keep that in mind. But it is case by case. There's we have lots of different options, and I can run those uh, run through those with you. Um, but yeah, so uh, that, that's really the main thing I wanted to point out was just the the transportation logistics thing. There's we've got solutions. Something that came up uh, actually, I was on a phone call that um, someone asked me recently, and it, I think it's it's relevant to any project really, especially if you have a larger project. Let's just keep going back to you have thousand rolls or fifteen hundred rolls or you know, twenty five hundred rolls of film, whatever it is, or couple hundred boxes of paper is what happens if I need something while the records are with you, with us. And we, it used to be more of a kind of you know, paper napkin kind of style back in the day, but over the, over time and over the past couple of years, we actually built a system just like that. Uh, this is called our unity system, but we actually built another system. Our own coders did it, our own software team. And it's called BRS, BMI request system. And what that is, is you actually have uh, the ability to log into this web-based uh, portal. So if we have your record, you say, oh, I got a request. I need to get this. I need to get the files from here. We will get the request. It'll ping our team. It'll be uh, like a task for something to follow up on. What we'll do is we'll go find that record. Let's say it's microfilm. We'll find that microfilm roll, push it to the front of the line, prioritize it, get it scanned, and give you access to it so you can find those records and get them to whoever you need them to get them to. So you may be thinking, I'm not gonna be able to get this stuff. I'm not gonna be able to make requests or fulfill requests while these are here. How's this gonna work? That's what we've done. We have some clients that are just, it's maybe at one point it was up to, I think 20 requests a day because we had a couple 10,000 or so rolls with us. But they were just hammering us with requests, but they all got fulfilled because we have the system in place that allows us to track them prioritize them, get them back to the client and respond in the messaging saying, your request is fulfilled, here it is. And usually it's around, we like to have at least like a 40 hour time period, um, but depending on the, the specifics of our the individual project and client, that can be adjusted as well. So that's something that's a, a keep in your back pocket that we can fulfill requests while we have the material. All right, so moving on to digital reel as an option, this is, it, it's not versus, we, I put digital, uh, traditional slash digital reel. So traditional, the way BMI looks at it is when someone hears scanning, most typically think you scan something, you get a file like a PDF, TIFF, JPEG, whatever. And that's what most people think. So we call it the traditional scanning method. We also have our digital reel application that is a possibility for you. A lot of JSON clients use it. You can talk about potentially um, why, but right here just shows not a, us versus them, but just what you get differently with traditional versus digital reel. And the key thing to remember as Jake goes through this is it's not either or. It's not you either get traditional or you can get digital reel. You're going to have to take it. It's you can get traditional with the DR backup. You can get digital reel as your primary with crop image, uh, traditional PDFs or something of that sort as your backup. You can get there's a multiple options you have with this. It's not a versus, it's a and. So just with that note in mind, Put a little table together for you that Jake can show, kind of describe each of these um, uh, areas. Yeah, just kind of expanding on what Will was just saying. Um, we talked about it in the scope. So, you know, we're going to figure out what you have, what the volume is, and then the last part is where is it going to go? So this is a question I always ask. You know, it, once we've scanned these records, whether they be from paper, film, or fiche, and we create PDFs or TIFFs, 
you know, where, where's that going to go? Is it going to go into perceptive content, on base, laser fish, uh, banner, another system, or a hard drive? You know, how are you going to ex um, access those? You know, how difficult is that? Or do you have the things in place to be able to push all those files into the system? So these are all things that will help you work through. Um, but for a lot of projects, what we'll do is we'll include access to our platform while we're doing the projects so that you have immediate access to the files. Um, and what we found is that a lot of customers, while having access, will find that this is a much more useful tool than the perceptive or whatever it may be that they use for record management, and they'll stick with it. So in addition to having it as a trial um, or as a backup to their on base or whatever, uh, a lot of folks um, will use it as their permanent solution, or at least the solution for the long term um, for accessing these records. So it's a really useful tool. There's a lot of great things that come with it that you don't get with other systems. So the first thing is we actually create a repli replica of the material. So for microfilm and microfiche, that's really important because you're seeing an exact replication of the microfilm as opposed to cropped images. Just so the, uh, well, just to, on that point, these are images from Digital Reel. So just a, a snippet, but we actually, as Jake's saying, we replicate it. So you have that virtual replica, you have that historical context that never goes away. So you can always see where did this image come from? Where did, and there's, that's actually a fiche image in digital real, then you can of course go to the individual images, but shows the, the the real fish. But you may say, well, why is this named that way? Well, I can go. You can go look and say, oh, that's why, because it was named that way in the fish. They didn't just, you know, BMI didn't goof off and turn into something else. You can always see that exact historic uh, historical replica. Sorry, Jake. Yeah, no, that, that that's great to see those images because you can kind of see how the cropped images happen. It's basically cutting out little images. So you're not guaranteed 100% accuracy with that because the, the software involved, especially when you're using other companies, we don't know what method they're using. And if they're relying on the scanner itself, it will miss images. There's, there's no 100% guarantee. With the virtual replica, it's 100% guaranteed. It's all there. It's like videoing something as opposed to just taking pictures. You're not going to miss anything. So it's a really useful tool. Um, of course, it's secure. So you have cloud access, which is really important, especially with what we've gone through in the past couple of years with uh, remote access. So now you don't need to come in that one day a week or however it was for your guy, uh, for how you guys did it during COVID. Um, you can have access. Of course, we we like we locked that down pretty tightly with um, you know two FA and IP restrictions and user logins and being able to track all that stuff. So that's really useful tool as opposed to just having everything on a hard drive. Um, being able to search records. So this kind of goes back to that indexing cost. One of the biggest factors, if not the biggest factor, is indexing. So if you say, I want all my records indexed by the student record, and you have 2,000 rolls of microfilm, that's going to be a very expensive pro uh, project. But if, if you're not getting into that that every single day, and and you're, you're not sitting on a pile of money, it's going to be challenging for you to do that. So we have, a, uh, the system has it built in where you can do a global text search. So I can just type in a name, social data birth, really anything that's on the record. And it'll search through those records and find and locate those things for you. So instead of spending hours, uh, you know, going through each roll of microfilm and looking at and trying to find the right name or date of birth or whatever it may be, it's really just a matter of seconds. And it, the accuracy is pretty good. Of course, it's dependent on your quality. So it's not hundred percent. It's dependent on the quality of the microfilm depending on how it was filmed, um, how, you know, how well we're able to get the images out, what, you know, if it's type text, if it's handwritten, those kinds of things all factor into that. Uh, um, and that, Jake, so if you, just using DR as an example, digital real is, since you have that replica, let's say you do roll level indexing, we're going to continue on the microfilm example. You're already used to getting requests, walking over a cabinet, finding a role, going to the machine, putting it on there, scrolling around. You have generally an idea of where something's going to be and you have to print it out or save it to a thumb drive and put everything back. You're spending 10, 15 minutes per request just to use the physical copies. So even if you have role level index and you still have to go find it, you're just quick, quick, quick. I'm in. Maybe OCR works and it goes right to it. Awesome. The tech search. Maybe it doesn't. Well, you still just go, well, I know it's that role. Scroll, 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 scroll. There it is a couple minutes. You're, you're saving 90% of the time you were spending before. So we call that the building block approach, starting with what you're doing and what you're already used to. It's like cutting hair. You can always cut more hair. You can't cut less. 
You can always spend more money, get the basic of what you have now, get it digital, cross that, uh, cross that river from analog to digital, see if it works for you. If not, you can always do more later. You can always, no, nah, I need file level index. And I want you, I want BMI looking at every single page and getting every single piece of data. Always do it later. But once you do it, that bolt is shot. You've spent the money and you're stuck with what you have. At least you, you have the, the result of it. And then you're like, well, I better use it because it's there. It may be great. It may be not. So that uh, building block approach, especially for why need to find the record immediately? Well, you're not doing that now. So do you need to do it and spend all that extra money and you can find it in you know, a minute with another, another method. So that's just a piece of that. Always think building block approach, I can do more later. Back to you, Jake. Yeah, so and the next one um, is, you know, it, I don't see it a ton in this, uh, this registrar world, but I have heard of it. Um, and I know it happens a lot with our clients in other uh, sectors, is you have to create a, uh, you know, these files are permanent. So you have to have, you know, you have to maintain a copy of these permanent records. And so a lot of our clients are able to check that box of, you know, historically capturing all of that data as it is um, without any inaccuracies with digital real. So you can maintain, this is one medium of, of you know, retention. So you have it in digital real, you have the physical, or you have it in digital real and you have it in non-base, or you have it in digital real, you have it on a hard drive. Um, digital real checks that box because it is a historical archive of that material the exact way it is now. So you don't really have that with any other method. Um, so digital real is very important as far as checking that box of we've made an exact copy of this content. So it is being preserved the way it was or the way it is uh, forever. Um, and then lastly, grayscale enhancement. So I, I say this quite a bit. If you've talked to me before, which I see a few familiar names on there, I've probably said this, you know, when we when you scan it with, you know, scanning company ABC down the street and with anyone really, and you're just getting PDFs and files back, that file is what it is. So if it's a good looking PDF, it's going to be a great looking PDF and whatever system you put them in. If it's very illegible or if it's blurry or if it's just not, you know, dark light spots and it's, you just can't make out what it is in PDF format, that's what it is. There's really no going back from there. But with digital real, you have grayscale enhancement. So you can adjust images on the fly as you look at them as needed. So if this needs to be lightened up, you can lighten it up, darken up. We've built in all those tools, which if you were to ask a company to do all that for you, hey, give me these files back perfectly, it would cost a fortune for a company to be able to do that because each individual image on a roll of film, a sheet of microfiche, or just paper is different. So you would have to adjust the settings per that image. Well, perfect that, is also a very subjective term. I mean, something perfect, I think is a good true. image, Jake may say, this isn't that great. And then that's, it's right. an issue that is not uncommon in the scanning world is someone will say, these aren't that good. And we have our experts say that is a good image, but it's all subjective. It's very difficult to say, you know, have the same vision of what good is or. Yeah. You know, yeah. And that's another point in favor of digital real because you have the ability to adjust it. You have the ability to determine what's perfect. So we give you all the tools without that huge cost of adjusting the images to be perfect to what you want. Um, so it's going to be really necessary for some of the older microfilm microfiche records um, paper, we don't see it needed a ton, but it's always a possibility, um, but really important for microfilm and microfiche. And you may find that your images look great and the enhancement's not really necessary. And then you may find that you need a few images adjusted. So having that initial period of digital reel as a backup is going to be very useful for you because you'll be able to adjust those images and replace them if needs be. Um, and then, of course, if you're using it for the long term, you'll always have that ability. And you'll always have the, the ability to make it look the way you want it to look, um, which in most projects is going to be necessary. Now, you mentioned paper typically doesn't need it. And just on that point, the reason is because if we're scanning paper records, excuse me, if we're scanning paper records, we're creating basically a second generation image. So you have the original copy, the hard copy. That's the first generation. That is the record. We scan it. We're going straight from that to digital. So it's like, well, yeah, we're capturing the original. It's going to look great. Microfilm, microfiche, and aperture cards, the reason it may not be that great is because 
these are third generation. There was an original document. It was then photographed. Now you and created on microfilm uh, fiche or after cards. That second generation. We're scanning the second generation to give you the third generation digital image. So when you're photographing micro uh, records for microfilm, if Jake is uh, filming it one day and he has a certain light settings a certain time of day, maybe there's light getting in for some reason, or he just has it set up a certain way. He leaves a shift. I come in and I start filming. I may change something. You actually have different um, densities and different uh, light ratios on that film. So the same roll of film will actually have different qualities. And we could go into more of the film scanning process and fee scanning process of what we do to try to help with that. But you're going to have that disparity of the images on the same roll of film. And that's where something like this can be very beneficial. All right. Anything else on here, Jake? No, oh, I think we covered it. Well, I guess one thing to point out, if you've, if I've seen some familiar names, so I know I have talked with some of you folks. If you've come to ACRO or one of the regional PACROs, TACROs, um, or CACRO, you've probably seen this. Um, and if you are attending one in the near future, which we, we're going quite a bit these days, um, you'll see a screen by at our booth and we'll have Digital Reel up and going as uh, you know, just a way of showing folks um, some of the capabilities it has. Um, and also, of course, we can do live demos. We can, we, when we do the samples, we can put them in digital reels so you can see that as well. So we're, we're not trying to push this per se, but we do feel that this would be a very useful tool for you to use while in the production phase and possibly beyond, depending on what your, your long-term solution is. In either case, this is going to be a useful tool. We think you'll love it. All right. Are there any, well, like, since you can't speak per se, I'll check the QA, see if there are any questions. At the moment, there are no questions. So Jake, myself, good job. We answered everything. <laughs> Mark it down. All right, all right, well, so there are no questions right now. That's fine. I'm just putting all my contact info up here so it's not too crowded. You can reach out directly to me if you have a project, you're curious about doing something, you just want some ideas, even if you're just starting out, that's fine. Reach out to me. Uh, you can put your phone up to the screen and capture those to go straight to our website. We have a YouTube. Uh, it's called the Digital Imaging Channel. We do a video every, every third Thursday, but there's a bunch of videos on there. There's an entire playlist of digital reel. It's basically training videos, like one to two minute videos, but it's pretty much every feature you could find in digital reel, uh, which is not a ton. We keep it fairly sleek, but so you can find that up there, just videos on digitization in general. And then that's my personal LinkedIn. If you'd like to connect, that's awesome. But if you do have a project, uh, you can send me an email or call us, fill out a form on the website, and I'll put you in touch with Jake so he can start working with you, at least to explore some ideas. So with that, that ends our, um, that ends our webinar. We appreciate you coming, and there will be a recording sent out, and then this, video, this uh, recording will also be eventually put onto our webinar playlist on YouTube, so it'll be there as well. So thank you, and we look forward to hearing from you all. Have a nice rest of your Wednesday.